Anybody here like football? Any football fans in the house? Not going to ask which team. We're not going to start division in the church, but anybody? I got a couple of football fans. I love football. Now, I'm more of a college football guy. I'm from the South, so, you know, we're more into the SEC, but, but I like pro ball, too. Uh, you know, I'd be happy if it's football season year-round. I love it. And one of the best football games ever, this is going to ask you to think back a little bit, Super Bowl 34. Anybody remember Rams and the Titans? Okay. It was the last few seconds of the game, right? Tennessee's driving in for the game tie and touchdown. And on the final play, Kevin Dyson caught a pass over the middle. And he lunged for the goal line. And at this point, all of us are out of our seats, right? This is great. And he was tackled just short of the goal. In fact, he missed scoring that touchdown by one yard, three feet. He was so close, and yet he was so far. And he missed it by about the same distance, just so you can conceptualize it. When the ref raises their hands to signal a touchdown, that's the distance he missed it by. Now, here was someone who was focused, he was on target to win, and yet at the last minute, he was knocked off course. And we think of this, and we shake our heads, and we think, oh, how close, he almost had it. He was there. And you know, it makes me wonder how many times God has felt that same way about us. And God was laying this message on my heart this week, now, number one, my toes got stepped all over. And I thought, God, are you sure this is what you want to talk about today? And he never let me off the hook with it, so. Mark eleven twenty two through 25 says, Have faith in God. For Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go and throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it. Past tense, that's important. Believe you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And we're going to look at a few scriptures this morning to see this connection between what we say, what we believe, and what we receive from God. Now, God gives us this example in the beginning. Our, our confessions determine our reality, right? Right? It begins with salvation. If you look in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, one action has to follow the other, and they have to follow in this order, and it's important why. And we're going to find out a little bit. I'll get into that. But you can't just believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and never say it. Because what does the Bible tell us? The demons believe, right? But you're not going to see them in heaven. But they believe. They know the truth. But if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you know, God never changes, right? Now, when I say that our confessions determine our reality, I'm not talking about, well, you know, I want a Ferrari, so there's going to be a Ferrari in my driveway when I get home. Well, you can say that all day long, but I, I doubt you're going to have a Ferrari when you get back home today, okay? If you do, let me know, because I want to find out how you did it, but it's probably not going to happen. So I'm not talking about wishful thinking. I'm not talking about going around and just claiming whatever you want willy-nilly, okay? There has to be a process to this, and it has to be according to a biblical model. So when you say, I'm going to confess something, I'm going to believe I receive it, the next question you have to ask yourself is, okay, fine, based on what? Because it has to be based on the Bible. Anything you ask or need, you ask of God, but that question always has to be first. What's it based on? And when we say it has to be based on the Word, I want to make sure we have a clear understanding because this is something that God really revealed to me this week as I was getting ready for this. And it was one of these things, for me, it was revelatory. You may, it may be one you already are familiar with and you're kind of going, why was that such a big deal? But, you know, for me, it really opened my eyes. Because when we ask, what is the Word? Well, most people say, well, the Word is the Bible. It's the Word of God. Yes. But look at this. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. Now that's a little vague as far as, okay, the Word. Well, who's the Word? Well, John clears it up in verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this is talking about Jesus, right? Now, so far, this wasn't revelatory. I had read this one. This one I knew. Okay, the word is Jesus. This one I had. Now, look down at verse 17 in there. It says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, one thing God has really been doing with me with Scripture is he's really been pointing out these little nuances. Now, my wife would tell you this is no surprise. I'm picky anyway. She will tell you I'm the pickiest person in the world when it comes to language use. Um, I blame it on the fact that my undergraduate degree is in English and I was trained that way, but I think it's natural to me. I've always been a picky person because I think words are important because words are communication. And it's interesting, if you go back and you read a book from, say, the, the 1700s, 1800s, or even Shakespeare, go back a little further, the average person today, if they read that, is only going to understand about a third of what they read. And we ask ourselves, well, why is that? Because so much of the language has been channeled down into things to where now we have conversations with people that sound like, well, you know, you know it was like this, you know, like, like that, you know. You haven't communicated anything except a vague impression. You've used no words. And at one time, there were thousands of words in the English language alone that conveyed specific meanings. And we've lost that. And because we've lost that, when we read something like God's Word, we have a tendency to gloss over things. We're kind of reading it with that, yeah, you know, in the back of our head, and we skip on to the next thing. But this is important that we take time and pick this apart because it says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, two different things. Now, grace we're pretty familiar with. If you've been in church any length of time at all, grace is a pretty familiar concept. It's unmerited favor, right? It's where we get our salvation from. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And yet God gave it to us. That's grace. But truth... Truth about what? Well, in order for Christianity to mean anything, you have to make it personal. It has to be about you and God. There has to be that relationship there. That's what it's all about. It's the relationship between us and God. And God wants that relationship. That's why he sent Jesus, to bring us back into relationship with him. So when he says grace and truth came through Jesus, he's talking about truth about your situation, where you're at, with whatever your need is, Whatever may be going on in your life, he is the truth for your life. It has to be personal. And the question we have to ask ourselves as we're going to look at it is who do we believe? Do we believe the God in heaven or do we believe the God of the world? Because there are two, right? There's God with the big G, that's the one we worship, and God with the little g, right? Okay, that's the devil. We have an enemy. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we know which one we believe? Because a lot of people with Christianity, I'm kind of running down a rabbit trail, but there's a reason for it. With Christianity, a lot of people seem to have this idea that there's God on one side, there's the devil on the other, and I'm just kind of somewhere in the middle trying to get my way through. In fact, there was a Christian song that came out years ago, probably about 2005, 2007, somewhere in that time frame, that was called Somewhere in the Middle. And I loved it when it came out. Because it spoke to me and I thought, man, that, that, that feels like where I'm at right now. Somewhere between the hot and the cold. Somewhere just kind of in between. You know, as God grows you, sometimes you feel that way. And I loved that song. You sing it all the time. And finally one day God got a hold of me. And God just said, you know, you need to quit singing that. But I love this song, God. Why do you want me to quit singing it? He said, because it's not accurate at all. He said, there is no middle ground. He said, you're either serving me and you're following me or you're not. Because there is no third option. There is no middle that we kind of float in between and try and get to places. So when it comes up, who do we believe? Do we believe God or the world with anything? Now remember, if Jesus is our truth about our life, about our situation, make it personal. What do we believe? Well, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 tells us, he says, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, if God is truth, and he says that he meets your needs, and he's already shown you, remember, we confess and we believe, it's a two-part process. If God is truth and says he meets your needs, that he's your healer, that he's going to take care of you financially, anything that you have going on, and yet you're broken, you're miserable, why is that? Well, which truth is real in your life? The one that says you're prosperous and well or the one that says you aren't? And they can't both be right because they can't both be true. There's only one truth, remember? And we just saw where that is. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it has to be through his word. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to have attacks, and we're going to look at this later, and I'm not saying it means we're all going to have sunshine and roses, because you're not. 
We're going to look at that. But Joshua tells us, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Now, again, there's another one we tend to gloss over, but it's important. Choose you this day. That means this can't just be a one and done. This has to be an everyday occurrence in our life as we have our Christian walk with God. Till he calls us to glory, this is part of your everyday routine. The minute you roll out of bed, you're choosing who you're going to serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, we can put this in modern English if you want to say it this way and say, choose today who you're going to follow, what the world says about your situation or what God says about your situation. Choose today who you're going to serve because it's always going to be one or the other. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, we're going to come back to this in a minute, but it says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. There's that idea of choice again that we have. Now, the choice is entirely ours. And I've got a few minutes, so I'm going to give you a couple of brief examples. Number one, I'm sure at some point, somebody in this room, everybody here has signed a contract for the most part, right? Whether you've, you've rented a house, you've bought a car, you've took out a mortgage. At some point, you have signed some type of piece of paper that has obligations between you and the third party, correct? Okay. Now, let's say that, for example, you're renting a place. And someone comes up to you and says, you know what, starting next month, you owe us an extra $500 a month for this particular fee. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be a little upset about that. And I'd be going and pulling out my contract and saying, no, 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 you show me where it's in this contract that I have to do this, that legally I'm obligated to do this. But if I don't know my contract and I don't take the time to look through it, I'm going to be putting out a lot of money every month, right? And I may not legally have to do that. Well, God's word is our contract for our life. The devil is going to bring things into your life to attack you, to try and tell you a bunch of things about how you have to be this way. It has to be awful. Things have to be terrible. And again, I'm not saying it's going to be sunshine and roses because it ain't. But when the attacks come, do you have to put up with them? Well, what does your contract say? You know, when the attacks come, the first thing I ask somebody is I say, okay, you're under this attack. What scriptures are you going to? And you kind of get this blank look sometimes, like, what do you mean? Okay, let, let's go back and let's cycle back. Let's see how this is done, right? Because when Jesus was attacked in the garden, right, he was under the temptation for 40 days in the wilderness. What did he do when the tempter came? He used God's word every time. And the example that he sets for us is the example we're supposed to follow. As Christians, we always say to ourselves, we're trying to be like Jesus. Well, if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to be doing what Jesus did. When the attacks come, where is our word? Remember, the Bible talks about the armor of God. There's only one piece out of that armor that's an offensive piece. It's the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right? So that's how we fight, because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against the things in this world. We're fighting against spiritual forces, right? So that's how you have to do it. You have to go to God's Word. If you don't know what your contract says, the liar is going to pull the wool over your eyes every single time. And you're going to be paying out a lot of things spiritually that your Savior bought and paid for you that you don't have to pay out. But if you don't spend any time in that word, you're never going to know, right? I'm going to give you a personal example, and my wife's actually in there, so I'm going to put her on the spot for just a second. When my wife and I met, the doctors had diagnosed her with epilepsy. And we dated for several years, and while we were dating, she was from a, a background denomination that, that it was kind of God will heal you if it's his will, yet you never really know, kind of vague. And not really a lot of expectation of it. It's just kind of a we, we hope for the best kind of thing. I was brought up in a Pentecostal church that says God is your healer. You know, we're going to pray about this and God's going to take care of this. And so I would give her scriptures and I would be like, look, you know, I believe God can heal you of this. Now, it don't matter what I believe. She had to believe it, right? But I'm going, I believe you can be healed of this and set free from this. Well, the first time I tried that, she got mad. She didn't like hearing that at all. But you know what? If you love people, you're going to go back and tell them anyway. 
A lot of times this world says, you know, well, you just have to accept things the way they are. You have to accept people for where they're at. And if it's contrary to God's word, you got to tell them God's word. You tell them in love, but they may get mad, and that's okay. You know, I tell my kids, it's like, I love you enough to let you hate me, but I'm going to tell you what's right, whether you want to hear it or not. I'm telling it to you in love, but here it is. And so I kept at her with it. She, she's, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. And sometimes I'd go months at a time and never bring it up because it always started an argument. But I loved her. And I didn't like seeing this thing on her that I knew she didn't have to bear. I didn't like seeing that burden there. And so I stayed after it. And two of the scriptures that we gave, uh, one was Isaiah 53, 5. And it's talking about the sacrifice of Christ. It says he was pierced for our transgressions, right? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, again, here's where it pays to be picky. This is Old Testament prophecy talking about Christ who was to come. This was written several hundred years before Jesus was born. And yet Isaiah writes this present tense. And if you believe that the Bible is inspired, which I do, God wanted it said that way for a reason. He was calling it present tense about something that happens in the future. Well, that's part of faith, right? Evidence of things not seen, substance of things hoped for. And I think that if the Bible takes time to actually repeat itself, it really bears paying attention to from us. And Brad, you're probably going to have the wrong reference on this one because I, I was in a hurry when I typed this up and gave you the wrong one. Uh, but it's 1 Peter 2.24. And it essentially says the same thing, but it wraps up with saying, by his wounds you were healed, past tense. Now, if you were healed, that's referring back to the cross. Remember, Peter wrote this about 60 or 70 years after Jesus. So he's looking back to the cross. Isaiah's looking forward to the cross. Isaiah's saying you are healed. Peter says you were healed. Now, again, if Jesus is the word and if Jesus is our truth, you can't be sick and be healed at the same time. So which one do we believe? Now, in Lynette's case, what happened, I kept giving her these scriptures, and you know, those little seeds fell on good ground, praise God. Because she doesn't have epilepsy anymore. But you know, I'm going to tell you, attacks come. Now, when I say this again, bear in mind, I'm not trying to sell you sunshine and roses because we have an enemy out there. So when we went to the doctor, she had what she thought was more activity on one of those EKGs than she'd ever had before. In the natural, there was every reason for her to be freaked out and saying, you know what, this stuff really doesn't work. I'm worse now than I was before. <laughs> but if you know my wife, what happened? She got mad. Only this time it wasn't at me. Praise God. <laughs> she got mad at the devil. And she said, God's word says I'm healed. I'm not putting up with this. We went back for another test the following week, and you know what? The Bible says that when we resist the devil, again, we resist the way God resisted. We quote the word at him, and we mean it, and we have that faith. He's got to go away. It's not that he might. He has no choice. I explain it to my kids this way. If you walk into a dark room and you flip on the light, the darkness doesn't get to say, well, I'm not really going to leave. I think I'm going to hang out in here too. It goes, and it has no choice but to go, and it goes fast. Amen. <laughs> it has to leave. But the attacks, sometimes they'll come. So the very next thing, the doctor delivered her from epilepsy. Now, by this point, we're married. We we're wanting to try and start a family. And he says, well, yes, you're off the epilepsy. That's gone. That's good news. But we found this other issue. Really? Okay, we found this other issue. What's this? He said, well, you've got this heart problem now that we've detected. And it's something that's serious. You're going to be on medication for the rest of your life to try and control it. There's nothing we can do about it, and worst case scenario is you could drop dead at any moment. You just never know. There's no way to predict it. And because of the medication, you can forget having kids because it could cause all kinds of problems. Okay. So we're back to faith. We're back to praying, and we're saying, okay, God, this is what your word says. I'm going back and standing on this. And now the person who told her this was one of the top, card I think he's one of the top five cardiologists, number one. At the time, he was considered to be the number one cardiologist in the nation. So this guy had written probably about a third of the medical textbooks that are still on the shelves today with cardiology. 
So it wasn't like just, just any cardiologist telling us this stuff. This guy had done research. He, he had shown all these graphs. He showed us textbooks. He actually offered us some of the textbooks he had written about the subject. And he said, if you want to go back and read more, here's some stuff I've written down. And it was hundreds of pages. Well, you know, that's not news you want. You remember what I told you at the beginning of the service about that song, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, My God. That's who I serve. Well, we went back to prayer and we prayed about it. And obviously God took care of things because we have five wonderful children. My wife has no problems. So she was delivered from something, number one, that they say doesn't really go away. It went away. And then she was healed of something they say can't be healed. Praise God. And that's all God. Amen. But when I say those attacks come, and I mentioned the seeds falling on the ground, Matthew talks about it in chapter 13, verse 22. The seed, you know, in Jesus' parable, he's talking about the Word of God, falls among the thorns, refers to someone who hears the Word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the Word, making it unfruitful. It's very possible when the devil brings these attacks to us that no matter what we've been studying in the Word of God, if we're not renewing our mind daily and making this part of our walk, there he goes pulling the wool over our eyes again and stealing from us. So the first thing we have to do is we have to do a mind check. Because we have to ask, okay, what is the will of God? Because we know God has a will. Romans 12, 2 tells us, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, Gil, you mentioned that this morning about that word conform. Right? Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That means you don't have to listen that the world's option is the only option you have. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. So people all the time, they say to me, say, I don't know God's will. I don't know how to find out what God's will is. This is how you do it. God's word is God's will. And it really is that simple. It's not this magical, nebulous kind of thing we can't ever tap into. Because right here, God just said we could. But what do we have to do? We have to be transformed by renewing our mind. This isn't something we pray and ask God to do for us. This is something he told us to do. Then, he says, if you do that, then. This is an if-then statement. So that's a promise. If you renew your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And you say, but that's hard. That's difficult to do. <laughs> and I love this because that's one of the questions that popped into my mind. Go back and look in Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 11. Now, what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult. <laughs> and I, I read this, and I just kind of looked up. I said, really? Okay, I got you. It's not too difficult. It's not beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven, so you have to say, who's going to ascend to heaven and get this and proclaim to us so that we may obey it? And it's not beyond the sea, so that we have to say, who's going to cross the sea and get it so that we can obey it? Now, remember I told you earlier there was this revelatory moment when I was doing this study. This is where it came in. No, the Word is very near you. Who did we just learn earlier who the Word was? Jesus. So you can insert here, no, Jesus is very near you. He is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. Confess, believe, receive. And he tells us in verse 15, see, I set before you today, there's that daily choice, life and prosperity, death and destruction. Notice the ands, because that's important. It means that one goes hand in hand with the other. This isn't an either or. This isn't a smorgasbord where it's like, well, I got life, but I've also got some destruction over here. No, it's life and prosperity, death and destruction. The choice is entirely ours. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Now I'm going to stop right there just a second, because most of you may have been like me with this, and you've always heard people say the promises of God are yes and amen. Right? That's true, but that's not complete. And God pointed that out to me with this, because look at how this works out. Remember I told you, he wants a relationship. This is a partnership. The promises are yes in Christ, and so through him, what? The amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. 
So he said yes, and then we get to say amen. Now, what does amen mean? So be it. When we agree with God's word, and remember, God's word, the word, that's Jesus, concerning anything, God gets glory. He is the yes, we're the amen. He already paid for it. We receive it, and we praise him, and then he gets glory. Now, again, this isn't about denial. This isn't about wishful thinking. If you've been told something bad by the doctor, if your bank account looks horrible, whatever your situation may be, it's not about denying that that's happening right now because it is real. Okay, spiritual attacks are very real. Our enemy seeks about seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. If he didn't have the ability to do that in our life, it wouldn't have said that. So, again, I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. If it's a hard situation you're facing, I've been, I've been in situations where I get it. It's difficult. I'm not trying to say it's not. So this is not about denial. It's not about wishful thinking. But what it is about is confessing Christ into the situation. Again, he gave us that example in the wilderness, right? He went 40 days without eating. That, that's a God thing, you know? And then he was tempted with food. I can't even imagine the level of temptation he went through. And it says in that passage that he was tempted in all ways, just like we are. Think about some of the deepest, darkest temptations you've ever had, even ones you don't even want to share with anybody. Jesus had the same thing. And it's not a real temptation if there's not the opportunity there to say yes to it. So while Jesus is the Son of God, yes, when he was here, he was entirely operating as a man. And a lot of people kind of tend to gloss that fact over. They want to think, well, yeah, but he was Jesus. No, no. Yes, he is Jesus. But if he didn't have the opportunity to give in to that temptation, it wasn't a real temptation. And then he's lying if he says to us, oh, I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. No, no. If he had an out, if he had an ace up his sleeve, it doesn't count. But he didn't. He went through it just like you and I go through it so that he could say, I've been there. I know. And this is how you don't give in to it whatever it may be, whether it's fear, whether it's worry, whether it's anything, this is how you don't give in to it. And he gives us the example, and he gives us his word. God even gives us this example in the beginning of how things work. Look at Genesis 1, and God said. <laughs> God used words to create everything, and he did it through faith, and he did it through Jesus, through the word, right? He believed it. There was no doubt. James chapter 2, verse 14 and 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but doesn't do anything about it, well, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So it's not just enough to say that we believe it. Again, the demons believe. What are we saying? Because in our heart, it says that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So when someone hits you with that bad news, when someone gives you that situation, what's the first thing out of your mouth? You may be at church on Sunday saying, amen, yep, God's going to take care of me. Monday morning rolls around, you look at the bank account, and you think, oh, we're broke. I don't know how we're going to make the bills. We're so short. This looks awful. What just happened? Right? Right? What's really in here that we really believe? You know, this is one God has really been working us through because we went through a, a tremendous, and some of you know this, you know, a tremendous, tremendous debt issue. And it's been about a two-year process so far. And we went back and got in God's word, said, okay, God, what do you say we need to be doing? We were already tithing. And he said, you know, well, you need to, to give offerings. Let's do this stuff. Let's start giving. If you want to give, you got to, you know, receive, you got to give. And God really started revealing a lot of things to us as we renewed our mind daily, as we spent time in God's Word on the subject and looked up what the Word said. Now, again, this has been about a two-year process, but we have paid off more debt in two years with less income. <laughs> Praise God. And there's no explaining it. Now, I also have a degree in business, so I've gone back, and trust me, I've, I've taken accounting classes, and I passed them. Okay, you can look at my transcript. I know how to add. I can show you so many times in our ledger where it doesn't even make sense. And we check this stuff on a regular basis, people. I'm not, not like going like two and three months. I'm talking like several times a week. We can look at this stuff. The bank routinely has more money than we have. I don't know where it comes from. I don't question it. I thank God. <laughs> and things are getting paid down. And my income now is less than it was a few years ago. I changed jobs. God put me in a different place. The income was about half of what I was making. And yet we're giving more, we're tithing, we're doing more. And that's not to glorify ourselves. That's, that's putting 
feed on our faith. Okay, it's not enough that we believe. We have to put into practice what we believe. And now when it comes up, the other day even it came up, and we were doing the math, and I looked, and I thought, hmm, according to this, we're going to be about $300 short for the month, and this is like the middle of the month. My wife and I didn't panic. We didn't pull out our hair. What are we going to do? What can we sell? What can we tap into? We just said, okay, let's pray about it and give it to God. And we did. We thanked him for it. We didn't worry about it. Didn't worry at all. Two days later, I went back and I checked the account again. I looked through and I went, hey, honey, you want to see something neat? She said, what's that? I said, according to this, we got $300 to the positive at the end of the month. <laughs> Nothing had changed. <laughs> I'm telling you, and this is the kind of stuff, if you put God to the test, and with money, he says to do it. But if you'll just dare to believe God and just step out and say, God, you know what? I don't care if it makes sense to my natural mind. If this is what your word says, I believe you really are the truth. If you will step out and dare to believe that, you will be amazed at what God will do. You know, we're going to look at one real quick here. Um, let me find it in here real fast. I may just skip around just a minute. Yeah, I'm just going to skip real quick to this one. I will, I'll give you this one first. Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about faith because we have to have it. Confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. So if you're waiting for the bank account to show positive numbers before you believe God is your supplier, it's never going to work. If you're waiting for the doctor to tell you that you're healed before you believe in your heart that you're healed, never going to happen because it's not the way it works. And a lot of times we confuse hope and faith as the same thing. Hope is always future tense. So if you're looking for something to occur in the future, that's hope. Now, the Bible talks about hope when he says about Christ's return. We have a blessed hope that one day he's coming again. We don't know when. Jesus says he doesn't even know. Only the Father knows. That's hope because we know it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen in the future. Faith is always right now. And then circumstances and reality have to change to conform. Either we're conforming to the world or the world has to conform to God's word. That's the two choices we have because we're either serving God or we're serving the world. And we even see this in the ministry of Jesus. Again, Matthew 12, 34 says, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I wonder how many times maybe it is that God's not us. We're not waiting on God, that God's waiting on us. Now, in my case with our finances, that's exactly what it was. I got so mad to the point where <laughs> if you ever want to talk about the grace and mercy that God gives, I should have been a little pile of ash a long time ago for my attitude because to my shame, I, I have sat there and prayed before and said, you know what, God, you've seen our situation. You've seen what my wife and kids are going through. If you're not going to get down here and do something, fine, I'll just do it myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been there. Praise God, I'm not there anymore. Okay? There is proof that God can fix stupid. <laughs> okay? Because if he couldn't, again, I, there wouldn't be any hope for me up here at all. But, you know, God is merciful, and he knew that. Again, he knows our days from beginning to end, so he knew I was going to have this stupid stage, as my mom used to call it, right? I think that's how she labeled my teenage years, my stupid stage. And she was right. But, you know, we go through that time spiritually, Right? And for me, that was one of those. And God showed me, he said, I'm ready to give you all these things. Look at the truth of my word. It says I've already met your needs. You know, the pastor gives the example. If I had my Bible today, I've got my electronic Bible. I had my real one. I laid it on the steps here, and I said, okay, this is your gift. Come and get it. It's here for you. And you stayed on the pew and just said, you know, Lord, if it's your will, please, please give me that gift. He's sitting there going, I gave it to you. It's right here. And you don't ever pick it up. Whose fault is that that you missed out? It's not God's. He already did his part. Sometimes we have to wait on God. Sometimes he says, not right now, and we have to be patient, one of those fruits of the Spirit. But what I have found in my own journey is a lot of times what God's waiting on to start that process, he's waiting on us to take that step of faith. You know, the journey down any road always starts with putting that first foot forward. I mentioned this morning that Eric, my oldest son, and I got a chance to go tent camping this weekend. Right, buddy? And we got to do some hiking on the Appalachian Trail, do some rock climbing. It was a good time. But if we just stayed in the campsite and we had never taken that first step to go towards the trail, we never would have done any of the amazing things we got to do this weekend. Yes, you did. 
He, he did go up a whole mountain. He, he did some serious rock climbing this weekend. But if we hadn't taken that first step, we never would have gotten to that end point. And that's the same way it is with our Christian walk. If we don't take that first step of faith, right? And Jesus even ran into this. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it says, He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And verse 6 just, just hurts right here. He says, And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, this is Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Word, saying that he can't do something. And what was the whole reason he couldn't do something? Is because the people that were there to receive it didn't believe it. It wasn't that God didn't want to do it. It wasn't that he wasn't willing to do it. He was there. He was like, I'm here. I'm ready to do this. Let's do this. And they just said, I don't think you can, God. I don't think you're big enough for my situation. That wasn't God's will. Because God's will says it's his will that none of us should perish. Okay, and that doesn't just mean a spiritual death. That means any lack that we have. That's not God's will that we lack the things he said we have in his word. But how do we get that faith? If we need it, how do we get it? Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard through the word about Christ. And I love the King James Version of that because it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. There's that word again. So faith comes by hearing Jesus. You spend time reading the word. You read the words of Jesus. I had a pastor one time who talked about that scarlet thread that ran through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I wish I had his notes because he had a descriptor for Jesus in every single book of the Bible, and it was amazing to hear him go through it. But in every single book, Old Testament and New, there's an example of part of what Jesus is revealing to us. So I've asked this question before, and I'll ask it again. And it's not one I expect an answer to because this is one we have to ask ourselves daily. Understanding that we are in the last days, what kind of time are we spending preparing ourselves for that time? I know for my own part, I'll say I probably don't spend as much time as I should. And I try to do what I can. And I think, well, you know, God, but I'm busy. I've got all these things I'm doing. I've got all this stuff that I'm doing. And he reminds me, he says, seek you first the kingdom of God, and what? And all these things will be added unto you. That's another thing he's kind of been working on me with, is the idea of this concept of tithing my time. Give time to God, and you'll have more time to do the things you need to do. It just seems to be the way he works with things. Now, if we think back on our football analogy, if we really believe we're living in the last of the last days, Think of it like this. We're in the final seconds of the big game. It's third and goal. There's no timeouts. The ball has already been snapped, and our quarterback, Jesus, has identified his receiver and has already thrown the ball. Now everything really depends on the receiver. And the question we have to ask ourselves today, what are you going to do? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word today, Lord. Thank you, God, for growing us. Thank you for your grace for that unmerited favor that none of us deserve. But I thank you, Lord, for your mercy, that you love us, that you called us out, even though we could never do anything to deserve it. That you see our lives, you see where we're at. And just like with the prodigal son, we come to you and we say, Dad, I want to come home. You stand there with your arms stretched wide. And it's such a joyous moment. Your love is unconditional, God, and we thank you for that today. I pray, Lord, that in each of our lives today that you would continue to minister to our hearts. Let your word find fertile ground in us today, God. Equip us to go out, Lord, and to do your work. Because it's not about just receiving things so we can have things, God. It's receiving things so that we can turn around and take that and bless others. That we can minister to other people. That we can take people who are hurting, people who are in darkness people who are lost and dying, and we can show them there's a better way. There's a truth that's there for each of us, and that truth is you, Lord. God, I pray that you would be with us as we go through this week. Show us, God, in our, our spiritual walk how we can renew our minds daily, what we need to do to be on that walk with you. 
that we can walk down that path, God, and, and do it for your glory. Just like the trip we got to take this weekend, Father, every step was, a, was an amazing thing. There were so many awesome things you showed us as we went down that path. And God, our Christian walk can be like that as well. Even in the dark times, God, they can be good because we know you're with us. When the devil comes at us like a storm, Father, help us to be not like Peter who turned his eyes off of you and sank in the water. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, regardless of that storm that rages around us. Give us that courage. Help us to be to each other that encouragement, Father, to build one another up that we can bear each other's burdens as you command us to do and lift each other up because we don't have to do this Christian walk alone, Father. And it's not just between you and me. It's also between you, me, and my brothers and sisters. And I thank you for that. God, this day is yours. We love you. We thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen.